Well, good morning. You guys were already quieted down and everything, which means I'm late to class. So thank you for being here. We're excited to get to continue um, our adult Sunday school hour on how to study the Bible. So let's pray and ask for God's help as we continue to evaluate just how we can um, really think through a, a constructive process that's supposed to aid us in evaluating what God has said so that we might love him and live for him. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace to us. It's your grace that strengthens us, that empowers us, that motivates in us a greater desire to love and live for you. And I pray that you would equip us this morning to have tender hearts to receive your word and your truth, that we would be ready to um, recognize the ways in which we fall short, and that we would eagerly um, turn from sin and trust in Jesus more and more with each passing day. We ask for your grace and your spirit to be at work in us this morning, and that we would be equipped to live in a way that's pleasing in your sight for your glory. We love you, Lord, and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So over the last several weeks, we've been talking through um, this process called inductive Bible study. And this inductive Bible study process really has been summarized down to three primary steps. The three steps first start with observation. And in this observation step, we're really looking at the facts of the text. So as we're studying a passage of Scripture to understand what the author originally meant, we're looking at the details. We want to understand what it is that's actually being said, both grammatically, historically, contextually. We want to understand the facts. And moving on from step one, we then would look at step two, which we looked at last week, which is interpretation. We want to understand what it is the author's meaning to communicate. Meaning is not something that's um, ambiguous or something that is um, multiplied, but rather the meaning is located under the author's intent. And so we need to look at the facts to derive or to arrive at the meaning that the author intended. And today we're going to look at the third step of inductive Bible study. It's called application. And in this step of application, our goal is to actually respond to have a right response to what the author meant. So this process of step one, two, and three is really looking at what does the text say, what does the text mean, and then finally, what does it mean for me today? How should I live? So application, step three, is what we're going to look at today. And I think the first step in really talking about application and let me correct a statement I wrote in here. I said, what does it mean for me today? That's, that's incorrect. Not what does it mean for me today, but how does the original meaning apply in my life today? So I wanted to correct that as it popped up in my head. But today we're going to talk about the difference between meaning and application. What is the difference? Well, meaning first refers to what the author intended to communicate through the text written. Since the text's meaning is connected to the author, it will be the same meaning for every Christian at all times. Readers do not determine the meaning of a text, nor does the meaning change based on the reader. So meaning is something that is fixed. It's not something that uh, we determine on our own, but we actually arrive at what the author intended. Readers need to respond to the meaning that God put in his word, and so we, we aim to apply God's meaning in our lives. So application, rather, is a term we use to refer to how the readers respond to God's inspired meaning. Application is how one meaning impacts the specific life situations of the reader, which can be various. Application is finding what actions God intends believers to take in response to his word. But all application is meant to be guided by the meaning and Uh, of the original author. Therefore, we still have boundaries with which we're looking to apply scripture, apply the author's original intent. So this, this question of meaning means we ask, what does the passage mean? What does it intend to communicate? Rather, the application question asks, how do I apply this meaning to my life? So I came up with this little visual aid here that's helpful in kind of thinking through the distinction here. So if we have a singular meaning from that meaning that the author intended, we will find several applications that ought to be rooted in the original meaning of the author. 
So my application is not going to be arbitrary from the intent of the author, but there are going to be more than one application in regards to how we ought to live in response to the truth presented in God's word. So although this concept may be easy to understand, knowing the distinction between meaning and application is a must for students of God's word. And oftentimes when when you're discussing um, God's word with other people, this is what's getting confused. People are confused between the difference of meaning and application. So, application. Why is application so important? Well, Scripture actually tells us that we ought to apply God's Word. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, speaks to this truth specifically. James would write, saying, But be doers of the Word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he is like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So I wanted to really think through what it is that James is looking to communicate to us through this text. He calls us to be doers of the word. This idea of being a doer is not just saying, you need to do the word, you need to obey the word, but it actually is the term doer in the sense that there ought to be a sense of identity. This is characteristic of how we should live. Our life should look like being a doer of the word by the fact that we actively live according to God's word. This concept of application is not merely applying the Bible to our lives, but it's about conforming our lives, rather, to God's word. He also says that we're not to be hearers only, deceiving ourselves. So the question is then, if we're supposed to be doers, he's contrasting that. He's giving a positive affirmation of what you should do, and instead a negative statement of what you ought not to look like and the consequences of it. If you learn um, some historical or grammatical facts about God's word, or even understand the author's intent, but you don't live differently then we're actually fooling ourselves to think that we have learned and are living according to it. We can't have biblical application without knowing what the text means, but that's why we must observe and interpret God's word first. This is a process. But the danger is that we can know God's word without living according to it. And that's why application is so crucial. He also says in this text that no hearer Um, remembers. So it says there's an issue here that the hearer actually forgets, rather the doer acts. So he's contrasting those who listen and maybe even receive truth from God's word, but they don't actually respond in obedience. They don't act according to God's word. And so we need to see that there's these two sort of roles that can come out of our response to God's word. If we are to uh, be diligent students of God's word, we need to remember that we ought not to just gain information intellectually, but the goal of understanding God's word is that of transformation, of real change. And that's what God's word does in the life of a believer. So he also says, he says, those who look and persevere will be blessed in his doing. So here, there's some, there's some indicators of what it looks like to study God's word for the purpose of transformation. The idea of look here indicates a carefully and cautious observation, not a mere glance, and then continues, uh, not a mere glance, but one that continues in studying God's word diligently. And that's the one who receive blessing in the way that they should live, which is according to God's word. So we need to recognize that God's word calls us to apply God's word. And application is really the aim, the ultimate goal. But sometimes we either skip the first steps, we'll jump to the end and just try to apply God's word without really understanding um, any of the facts or the meaning that's present in the text. But rather, we just want to jump and say, what am I supposed to do? But we need to go through this process and also not forget, just because I'm excited about what I'm seeing, I need to make sure that I'm thinking through, what does it mean for me today. Not what does it mean for me today. I apologize. Not what does it mean for me today, but how should I live according to this meaning. See, I even have these phrases that you just kind of pick up from life, and it's like, oh, that's not the right word, you know? And so understanding that difference is really important, and I'm 
Sure, you can tell I'm just doing that for your benefit. Um, so, Jesus said it this way in John 14, 21. He said, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. This is not something that's like a step two to having God's word. It's rather saying, this and is saying, these are tied together. If you have God's commandments, you will keep them. This is, this is not a different step in the sense that it's, it's furthered on down the process, but it's all meant to be this one concept of keeping and following, of, of having and keeping God's word. So we may be tempted to think that if we observe scripture and understand passages and even the flow, and you can memorize large texts of scripture, that we've done our study and it's done. But there's even been, uh, I was reading an article recently about um, an atheist who memorized the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. But he's an atheist. He doesn't even believe God exists. So recognizing that it's not just the, having the content in your head, but actually applying and living it out in your life. So unless we apply those truths in our lives according to Scripture, we're not accomplishing anything of real value. So I think it's important, though, to recognize that most of us in the room would say, I don't really read my Bible with the express purpose of not applying it. I, I intend to, um, but what does that actually look like? And I think there's really some obstacles that get in our way. So we, uh, we often just struggle with understanding a passage of Scripture, which is why we have steps one and two. That's why it's in an ordered process of observation, interpretation, and application. Sometimes we just don't have a lot of time. Um, life is busy. There's a lot going on in your lives, and we're either too tired or too distracted with, with the daily responsibilities we have. But let me, let me encourage you that this is something that takes time, especially application. A lot of times with application, I'm not sitting there looking at my Bible knowing exactly how it applies, but it's meditating on it throughout the week and thinking through this text over and over and, and ruminating over it so that I can understand, Lord, and praying, Lord, help me to understand the ways in which I need to respond to your truth rightly. Are there specific areas in my life which I'm not believing what this says? Also, there's, there's times where we just don't view the Bible rightly. That can be an obstacle to us really applying God's word. Sometimes we come to scripture just wanting some sort of encouraging thought for the day rather than asking God to change us and expose sin in our lives so that we might love him more. Another obstacle sometimes that we encounter is we don't talk with others about our study. And I think this can be a huge help in pursuing application is when you actually have studied God's word and you go to talk with others who can see blind spots in your life, who can help you see ways in which God actually wants you to understand and live according to his word. So I think talking with other believers is a huge help in pursuing and understanding how to apply God's word rightly so that we might live in a way that's pleasing in his sight. So with that in mind, we're moving on to now really talk about a, a big picture view, a 30,000 foot view of application. So on the left, we have really what we're trying to do is understand the ancient world. We're seeking to understand this biblical, cultural moment of what was communicated and what was said in its context. And we're trying to understand it, well, all the way out here on the right, from a present world view. And the way we bridge this gap between the two is really with this idea called timeless truths. There are, there are universal truths that we find in God's word, truths that are rooted in God himself, who does not change. Truths that are um, true about the fallen world. They had lived in a fallen world in biblical times, and we now live in a fallen world that is broken. We also see that sin nature is the same then as it was today. And so there's these ideas that we can look for in a text that help us really narrow down what was true for them, and then thinking through how to, to bridge the gap to our present time today. So this gap here is spanned from the Bible to now, and we need to really think through one, in the earlier steps, how this is specific in Bible times. So when you think through studying a text, you, and you're thinking through application, you're really trying to narrow in on what was specifically said and how did they follow it. Is there an a obedience, a command that's meant to be obeyed? How did they obey this command? How did they disobey this command? And so you're thinking through what was specifically said then, but then you're, what you're doing is you're not trying to look at, okay, this was a command said to ancient Israel in the Old Testament, and I'm supposed to do exactly what was commanded then. Well, I'm not living then. I'm not an Israelite. So how do I understand it? Well, what you're looking for 
in that case, is a general truth, this, this universal or timeless truth, not something that is bound in time in the ancient world, but something that is timeless. So we would ask how everyone relates to it, not just how they followed it in the Old Testament or even in the New, but how everyone is meant to relate to the truths that are present in this text. So you're looking for what is true about God in this text? What does this tell me about the character of God, his nature, and how he deals with those whom he loves? What does this tell me about fallen man? What does this expose about my sinfulness, about sinfulness of humanity in general? And then from this specific to the general, we then come to seeking to apply it in our present world. So we're looking to say, okay, I understand how they followed it. I understand how this is actually a truth that bridges the gap of, of both then and now. And so I'm seeking to say, how must I follow this truth today? I need to get specific. I need to understand not just a general truth, but I need to understand what it looks like in my shoes today. So an example that I wanted to really look at with you guys is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So open up your Bibles with me and do 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth, and there was some, um, some strife. This is the church that um, Paul planted and labored for, and he wrote them several letters, even mostly confronting letters about how they're falling into sin and how they're rejecting truth. And one of the issues was that actually that their thinking was so awry that they didn't even think Paul was an apostle. And they questioned his apostleship, and they even tied it to some of his actions, and they said, you're not an apostle because you didn't even receive payment for ministry of the word. But all the other apostles, they do that. And so he's actually, in chapter 9, starting this argument to try to confront their poor argument. And he does so with scripture. He does it in um, this chapter that we're going to look at, chapter 9. And what's helpful about this text because it's going to seem really weird. Why, why did he pick this text about we should pay ministers? That seems pretty, pretty uh, convenient. No, the reason I picked this is because you actually see the apostle's logic and how he uses the Old Testament and then applies it in his current moment. And that's why this is so helpful in understanding how to study the Bible. So let me read through um, verses 3 through, um, oh, let's go through 11. Let's just go through the whole section, and then we'll come back and ask some questions and see how Paul really analyzes this situation. So starting in verse 3. This is my defense to those who would examine me about this issue of not taking payment as a minister. He says, do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier as his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Who tends to a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? The answer is no. And he says, does not the law say the same? So he's pointing them, he's saying, I'm making some arguments from what you can observe in, in normal life, but let me point out, I'm not just doing that. Let me go further to say, this isn't a human argument. This actually is, is something we see that God says in his word. He says, does not the law say the same? And then he quotes scripture. He says, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Wait a second. He's saying he has a right to be paid as a minister. What does an ox getting food from grain have to do with, with payment? That seems very different. And we could even look at this text and say, this doesn't seem to be following those principles that we were just talking about. He seems to be almost ripping this out of context, right? And just saying, hey, the Bible says you should feed an ox. So yeah, make sure you pay ministers of the word. But listen to how he questions. The question should reveal to us what Paul is thinking when applying this Old Testament text that's in an ancient time that's different than his own. He says, is it for the oxen that, God's, that God is concerned? So think about me. Think about me. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I, uh, I'm going to catch up with my words here eventually. So think about what Paul's asking. He's saying, is it the oxen that God is concerned for? The, the implicit question is No right? And I think the, the belief behind what Paul is questioning here is he's saying all scripture 
is breathed out by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and equipped for every good work. So he's saying God's word is profitable for man. It's instructive to us. So it's not just for oxen that God is dealing with here. Listen further. He says, what? He says does he not certainly speak for our sake as well? So that confirms our thought there. It's, it's not just about oxen. He's actually giving instruction for us to actually understand. So he's not saying that he's not talking about instruction about the muzzle ox, but he's saying that we need to understand the timeless truth. It says it has been written for our sake because the plowman should plow and hope and the thresher should thresh and hope in sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? I think it's, it's helpful for us when we look at Paul's logic here. He's not just talking about the ox. He's looking at it and he's looking at it from this universal principle, these timeless truths. He says, in the Old Testament, The oxen should benefit from their work. Don't withhold them. If they are laboring and working, make sure you provide for their needs. And he says, human workers even, the threshers in this text that he refers to, human workers should benefit from their work. They work with a hope to share in the harvest. And he parallels that with a common illustration that that scripture teaches about, about ministers who are laborers in the field that we're called to, and Jesus used that illustration. And so he parallels it and says, shouldn't ministers benefit from their work? So when you think through the argument that Paul's laying out from this Old Testament text, we can actually see the timeless truth that he's arguing for. It's something that Jesus said himself, that labor is worth his wages. Those who benefit from the work of others should then provide for those workers. That's, that's the truth that's locked in that the author, that God is intending to communicate and he was applying in specific context for how his people should live in a way that's pleasing in God's sight. And Paul takes this truth not out of context but rather in its context and says, do you see the core idea? Because the core idea needs to be applied in this context and you don't think that we are apostles because we're, we're declining a right that we actually have but rather he says, we do have this right. And then he goes on to argue that the reason we're declining that right is meant to show in a greater way the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we're not even claiming those rights. But you're wrong to think that we don't have the right. And that's what he's correcting here, and he uses the Old Testament to do so. And we would test this truth. Is it true that those who benefit from the work of others should provide for those workers? Yeah, we see that in the Old Testament. And we can test it, and we see that validated and affirmed in Scripture in the Old Testament. We see it present in the New Testament, and it's true today, and it will be true tomorrow. It's important for us to think through this application of this timeless truth. And then we come to the step was, how do I live according to this timeless truth today? So now that I've seen the universal truth, I need to think through it in my own life. If I'm uh, an owner of a business, should I pay my employees? Yes, Right? But I should do it because God's word instructs me to, and I should have a delight and a joy in actually obeying God in it, not just because, man, this really hurts my bottom line. It maybe even put me in the red this month because I can't operate my business if I keep paying my employees this way. But actually, a laborer is due their wages. Should I pay my taxes? Well, if I'm receiving protection and safety and well-being, I should pay my taxes. That's right for me to do so. And as he applies it here in this text, that would be the plain, easy application, the the most apparent application that the author's intending is, should we pay our pastors as ministers of word? Yes. But there's also other areas of our life. If a pastor was preaching on this text, and the only application for an entire congregation was you should pay your pastors, that would be very narrow, but it would be very true. But we also need to think through, for example, I grew up in a military church. Uh, We were in a military town, lots of military families. And people would cycle through like crazy. So one of the primary ministries of our church was a moving ministry. We would pack people up in their boxes, load them up in a truck, and we would do that all the time. And I loved it. It was like 3D Tetris. I mean, it was really fun to just like put things in its place and make it all tight and neat. But one of the things that I just observed as a child was, man, I always got pizza every time I loaded somebody's truck with boxes. And I loved pizza. And I was like, man, this is so cool. And as I grow up, I'm like, you know what? I've moved a couple of times. I should probably think about getting subs or pizza or something, you know, some chips and something for people that come and labor at my house. But 
it's actually rooted in God's word that it's right for me to think this way, that if somebody comes and works and labors and toils on my behalf, that it's right for me to think about meeting their needs, about providing for them and doing it in a heart that is generous and desires to honor God in the way that his truth tells me to. And thinking through ways that we can apply this in a life takes time. It actually requires effort and focus, but thinking through these principles will help us as we seek to live in a way that's pleasing in God's sight. So we should think through um, the application of these universal truths and how we apply it in our lives today. And it should um, um, be true then, it should be true always, and it should be true today. So thinking through this process is really helpful, and I think if you, if you really nailed it down to three headers, what's, what's really helpful in your studies, thinking through a text, what are some time-bound truths? What are things that are just details um, that aren't irrelevant, but that are specific to that cultural moment? So I'm probably not gonna eat locusts and honey like John the Baptist did, but those details clue me into the specific nature and purpose of God's provision for this ministry that God's called him to. But I'm not gonna eat locusts and honey. That's, that's kind of gross. But I also need to think about these, these um, timeless truths. What's, what's true then, now, and forever that, that is about God's character, about his fulfillment of his purposes, how he foretold of this prepared way that, uh, that Eli- an Elijah prophet type person would come and do. And there's these timeless truths that God is fulfilling his promises and he always will. And thinking through then, well, okay, not just a timeless truth, but now a timely truth. So you saw the time-bound truth, you see the timeless truth. What is the timely truth? How do I actually live in a way that sees who God is, that sees my sinfulness, and desires to live and apply it according to God's word? So thinking through these categories and really trying to bridge the gap between the ancient and the present is so important in seeking to apply God's word rightly. We start with observation and then interpretation, and we seek to apply it and live in a way that is according to God's word. So some questions I wanted to bring up that really can help you in pursuing applying God's word to your life is what does this say about God? That's a great question you can ask as you're looking through a passage of scripture. You've, You've looked at the details, you understand the author and the audience and the context, and you really nailed down even this this theological theme that the author is really trying to communicate to an audience, but then saying, okay, I get the theme idea, but what does this tell me about God? How is this, how is this true all the time because God does not change? What does this say about his character and how he acts and how he works? You can also ask, what does this say about sinful man? What does this say about how we are prone to sin against a holy God? How does this expose sinfulness in the lives of these people? And do I see areas of my life where that same sin is exposed? What does scripture instruct me to think, how does it instruct me to uh, then deal with my sin? There are also good questions of, is there a command to be obeyed? So thinking through, if you're going through a text of scripture and there's a clear apparent command, but it really doesn't come out in your application, I'm probably missing what it was that was being communicated. But what I need to do is ask some questions. Is this command Um, something that is uh, specific to a a specific group? Is it said from an audience to, uh, from an author to an audience of a specific group? If so, is it something that has a universal truth in it? Or is it something that was narrow as, you know, Jesus told the disciples to go find um, a man and say, the Lord has need of this donkey. Like that was a specific command, but that was to a specific people in a specific moment with a specific purpose that has been fulfilled. So I'm not needing to follow that command, but I need to understand then what is happening in the narrative of this story. So thinking through and observing commands and saying, is this a command I'm supposed to obey? That's a great question to ask and to to mull over as you think through application. Is there encouragement in this text? If the author is tending to, to bolster their faith or encourage their faith, then I ought to experience what the author is, his tone and his intent in the passage. So I need to think through what is it that's being encouraged in this text and how is that encouragement meant to make me live differently today? Also thinking through um, how does this expose my sin or, or how can I live out these truths today? Those can be helpful application questions in thinking through. So it's really important that as you come to application that you ask questions and you prayerfully consider what it is that God's word says and how you're supposed to live in accordance to it today. So steps in application, if you were to think through um, a a process um, of going through, I want you to think through first and foremost prayer. 
You need to pray for personal change. Prayer is an important step in every part of this process, but I wanted to reiterate it again today as we talked about earlier in our study. You must pray because Romans 8, 7 says, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. So if you're, if you're seeking to understand and apply God's word, but there's any sort of sinful resistance in your heart to who God is, or there's, there's some sort of doubt about his character and you're not sure about him, you need to come to a point where you actually turn and trust in Christ and, and say, Lord, I recognize the failings and the falling short, and I'm repenting of those sins, and I'm asking that you would help me to be changed according to your word. So praying to God and asking for personal change. And a prayer that is, is so helpful is Psalm 118. 119 verse 18 says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. We need to look to God for change and we need to look into his word and ask him to change us according to it by his grace through his spirit. Secondly, we would look at identifying what we talked about today, the timeless truth. I need to think through, are there things that are time bound in this text that are very specific, but what are some of the timeless truths and asking those questions to help you narrow down not just the theme of the text, but actually understanding what is the truth that is um, most clear and apparent that the author's intending to the original audience that is true then, it's true today, and it will be true tomorrow. And identifying that will be an important step in seeking to apply God's word. Third, we want to actually evaluate the daily living implications. So if this is a timeless truth, it's meant to be applied to my life today. So I actually need to think through my life. I need to think through my daily living. What are things I do? What are, what are engagements I have? What are relationships I have where I struggle with this topic or I struggle with um, really living in a way or what are encouragements I can take from this text that I see this is true and I see it true in my life because this is what God's doing in me already and to be encouraged that God's word is true and I need to continue to strive in obedience to it, not just because it's a tradition or a habit, but because it actually is something that God calls me to and I want to obey my master. Fourthly, we would say um, a helpful step is to write, talk, and listen. And you may do a mixture of these, but I think this is a really helpful step in seeking to apply God's word. <clears throat> Many of us, when we are forced to write, think much more clearly. We write down our thoughts, and that helps you to actually uh, contemplate the personal application. So either journaling or even just having a notebook where you go through in your Bible study and you think through what are some specific ways and writing that out really helps cement those things to say, I'm not just taking principles and putting them in my brain, but those principles actually move down to my hands and I ought to be living in a certain way. And writing can be a helpful process in that. We also are greatly benefited from discussion with others. So I would encourage you not to bottle up these great truths that you've uh, learn from God's word, but actually to talk with others about it and to say, hey, God's, you know, in small group or even conversations before or after church or as you invite people over to your home, to talk about God's word with other people to say, this is what God's been teaching in me in his word, and I've been really trying to wrestle through some ways that that applies in my life. And so there's times where other people have already studied through that text or they can actually, just knowing you, help you and aid you in the process of saying, this is really a way that would be really helpful for you thinking through this specific application in your life. So talking with others can be hugely beneficial when you are talking with family, friends, small group, or your church family, and invite them to actually help apply God's word. And what's amazing to me about that specific step in the process is it actually fosters humility. Because one of the things that our flesh is always vibrant to grow in is is pride and resistance to, to others being able to speak into our life. But when you actually come prepared and say, no, I know the facts, I know the author's intended meaning, and I, I really am trying to submit to the authority of God's word. When you invite others into that process, you are so ripe and ready and eager that it's, it's really a be- huge blessing and benefit in your walk with Christ as you seek to let those who love you and love the Lord uh, to help apply God's, to actually seek to apply God's word in your life. And then lastly, I would mention listening. If you really come to a point where you're kind of struggling with thinking through, I just can't think through some, some practical steps Um, After you've done the study and you've labored in God's word, it can be helpful to go and listen to a sermon. Think how others have applied this truth. What what are these universal truths that that they're pulling out of the text that are helpful in the application? So you can be really encouraged after doing the study on your own to go and listen to other faithful saints who have applied God's word in a way that is uh, true and helpful 
and encouraging. So thinking through write, talk, and listen as a step in your application process is really helpful in cementing and moving forward um, with, with application. And then lastly, I would say the most pivotal step is, is actually what James says. He says, be a doer of the word. Make an intentional plan and, and seek by God's grace to live according to God's word, to live it out and grow in love for him. So I hope this has been helpful for you. I hope it's encouraging you to get into God's word yourself, to spend time reading, reading the context, reading the specific text, writing down observations, seeking to understand what the author actually meant to the original audience, and thinking through what are these timeless truths that are true about God that I need to seek to live according to today, and what are some ways that I can be a doer of God's word, to actually um, walk according to what God calls me to, to not just have God's word, but to also keep it and be following what it is that he tells me to do. So next week, we'll continue in our uh, class on how to study the Bible, and we're going to talk through and circle back to what we kind of introduced a couple weeks ago, which is biblical genres, and really seeking to, uh, it'll be pretty fast, but because there's a lot of genres, but we'll seek to understand more specifically what, what are some things I should be looking for in these categories as I'm studying God's word, what are these different genres, and how we can Uh, seek to gain great observations to help us as we seek to know the living God who loves us and gave his son for us so that we can live in a way that is honoring and glorifying to him. So I hope this has been encouraging to you. Um, With that, you'll be dismissed and we'll join back together here um, at 1030 for worship.